We are live. All right. Can you Welcome, share everyone. The, share, share this, uh, the PowerPoint. Yep. So welcome to the CBD Hemp Processing Challenges and Opportunities for Innovation. We have a lot of ground to cover today, so I will just highlight a key aspect of today's presentation and introduce you to the presentation team. Today's CBD hemp extraction industry has often been compared to the wild, wild west. Emmett McGregor will provide more information on this, but in brief, many of the current processing plant designs which are still referred to as labs, regardless of their size, started as small glassware setups and were scaled up by folks who were frankly not very well versed in process scale up. They have high operating costs and poor quality control. What is clearly needed is to bring an integrated systems approach from the chemical processing industry that has spent 200 years developing sophisticated systems engineering methods. The focus needs to be on lowering operating cost, providing product quality and improving process efficiency. Whenever possible, processes need to be intensified and automated wherever they can. Who are we? Uh, next slide. Artisan Industries has over 85 years experience in separations and purification for the process industries. We provide solutions for all aspects of thermal separations from solvent recovery to drying. Next slide. And serve virtually all of the process industries from oil and gas to food and beverage and from chemicals to refining. Next slide. When Artisan decided to become a major supplier to the CBD hemp industry, we chose Sci-Fi Systems for their hands-on experience designing and installing large-scale hemp processing systems, as well as their in-depth knowledge of the complexities of hemp and the family of bioactive compounds that can be extracted from it. I will now turn the session over to Emmett McGregor, who is the founder and CEO of Sci-Fi Systems. Thank you, Rob, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Uh, really excited to uh, present to you today. Uh, our presentation is gonna take uh, the form of four parts. We're gonna be starting with legal status and market trends, heading into the characterization of the target compounds uh, that make up the uh, foremost part of the hemp industry uh, as it is today, and then go into a review of the existing process space as it is commonly deployed uh, and then finally uh, focus on what the opportunity space is for innovation and research. Uh, to, so to start us off with uh, the legal landscape, it's key to understand that uh, the hemp industry in the United States uh, was fully legalized as of 2018 with the Farm Bill. Um, previous to that, there was a 2014 provision on the 2014 Farm Bill opening pilot programs at a state level. Um, now it is federally regulated and uh, the USDA has brought in uh, rules that will take uh, hold uh, nationwide by default uh, if states don't regulate individually using uh, local regional regulations. Um, this is a little view of what the landscape looks like. You can tell there's a fair amount of complexity uh, with regards to regional regulations. Many states are adopting statewide rules and regulations instead of the default federal. However, there are a number of states that are defaulting to federal rules as well. Um, when understanding uh, the rules and regulations around the hemp industry, it's key to understand what is hemp. Uh, and specifically industrial hemp as it's defined uh, under the farm bill is cannabis sativa L testing less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. Recent regulations have clarified that that is the combined total of Delta 9 THC uh, if the acid form of the cannabinoid were converted into Delta 9 THC. We'll get into the details of what that actually means later on in the presentation. Uh, but this is a major change from some of the pilot programs. So a lot of burden of uh, 
the industry is falling on the breeders who have to breed high potency plants that yield high levels of other cannabinoids while having very low levels of Delta 9 THC, which is the psychotropic compound found in uh, cannabis marijuana. Um, and this is what uh, we typically see in the CBD hemp industry, uh, rather than the seed form that you often see in seed industry or in fiber industry. Um, we're large buds, highly resinous, uh, and showing trichomes. Um, the hemp space itself is uh, dominated at this point in the United States by the production of cannabinoids, uh, CBD in particular. Uh, is the foremost produced and consumed cannabinoid in the industrial hemp market uh, in the United States and uh, worldwide. There are worldwide um, uh, general acceptance of international trade in CBD. It is nation by nation as far as rules and regulations. However, in uh, now I believe a majority of the nations in the world have uh, some acceptance of CBD as an acceptable ingredient in some products. Uh, it is key to understand, however, that there are as uh, more than 100 cannabinoids that have been characterized from cannabis, uh, with uh, Delta 9 THC being only one of them. Um, and all of the rest of the cannabinoids are fair game for development of new products and uh, from pharmaceuticals through cosmetics uh, and dietary ingredients and even other uh, as yet untapped applications, especially in areas like veterinary. Um, so the uh, market uh, is following regulations as it is right now, um, the pharmaceutical market opened uh, with the approval of Epidiolex, uh, which is a pharmaceutical approved for seizure disorders. Um, this is the first uh, pharmaceutical to be approved utilizing cannabinoids directly sourced from the cannabis plant, uh, from the hemp plant. Um, this has uh, proven that there is a fertile ground for hemp derived ingredients going into the pharmaceutical space. Uh, it also uh, has added some complexity to the regulatory landscape of, of the CBD industry. Um, as it is right now, CBD itself as a purified ingredient does have protections under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, showing that uh, without a follow-up set of rules and regulations made by the FDA, it cannot be used as an ingestible product in either a food uh, or in a nutritional supplement because it is protected as a uh, recognized pharmaceutical. Uh, now that said, there are state specific rules and regulations that do allow for ingestible CBD products. We see that as being uh, some of the most popular products in the market right now are orally ingestible. However, interstate trade uh, is not technically allowable for those products, although uh, that is not being rigorously enforced at this time. Uh, and the FDA has entered into a new session of uh, notice and comment rulemaking uh, in order to issue guidelines and rules for the use of CBD in food products and in nutritional supplements, uh, or it may only uh, be nutritional supplement products. It has not made definitive statements at this time about what the most likely path forward for regulation is. Now, other cannabinoids, uh, it is a much more open market, um, and we'll get into what those other cannabinoids look like uh, at a later time, but it is to say that there is no approved pharmaceutical uh, that's gone through clinical trials yet with most of these other cannabinoids, and therefore they have the opportunity to be uh, filed as new dietary ingredients. They are being mar marketed currently as uh, food ingredients and as nutritional supplement ingredients, although the official formal process uh, for recognition as generally regarded as safe for most of those ingredients is still in process. Um, let's take a little bit of a look at the market. Uh, growth defines this market. Uh, it is really on a rapid growth trajectory, uh, both in, in business to business as well as business to customer sales. Uh, we are seeing growth. That said, is it is extremely competitive inside the United States and international competition is ramping up as well. Um, the total market size as of this year was somewhere in the order of 
uh, eight to nine billion dollars. We're expecting to hit uh, in greater than 20 billion dollars in this market by 2025. So this is a rapidly legitimating market sector to target. Uh, and it will be addressed by major market players internationally over the next few years. What are the products? Uh, the products are many, many different SKUs. Uh, there have been everything from, as I mentioned, orally dosed uh, capsules, tinctures, uh, foods of all types, including things like candies, but also snack foods, uh, and also things like bars. There are beverages, everything from cannabinoids being put into beers, uh, which have uh, recently actually been banned by uh, the alcohol regulators of the states and the federal government. But outside of that, there's been uh, CBD infused waters, juices, kombuchas, uh, sodas, um, and uh, dissolvable tablets. Uh, also, uh, uh, even larger growing sector of the market is uh, cosmetics and the cosmetics are explicitly allowed for interstate trade. So that's your lotions, uh, top, your topicals, uh, lip balms, uh, any sort of soap products. And also it's worth noting that vaporization products are also very popular in this segment. And uh, because they are not technically uh, consumed as a food or a nutritional supplement, they are being allowed at the present moment for interstate trade. Now, of course, what are the ingredients that go into these products? Uh, the price pressure in the ingredient space is very strong. You have a few different uh, market segments in ingredients. Typically, there's crude extract, just your broad, uh, you know, your, your crude extract, including everything from a very simple extraction. Uh, what's called winterized or de-waxed crude. Uh, and we'll go into these processes a little bit later. Uh, then distillate is a typically purified uh, form of the oil that has less colorants, less odor, and has a concentration between 70 and 90% of the target cannabinoid, while the crude oils typically are in the a 40 to 60% range, uh, depending. They can be as high as even 75% potency. Uh, and then you've got your isolate form of uh, CBD in particular, uh, which is very commonly used in cosmetics. It's probably the most commodified product uh, ingredient in the space. And then uh, not shown on this uh, particular chart, there's also the THC-free oil, uh, crude oil and THC-free distillates, which are uh, increasing in demand strongly those have been remediated by some specific technologies we will discuss later in the presentation. Uh, so now over to John to talk about the characterization of these target compounds. Greetings, everyone. I'm going to cover briefly here the characterization of the target compounds. Cannabis oil is a complex mixture. And where is most of this complexity coming from at this current time? It's coming from our nonpolar fraction. And our nonpolar fraction is targeting what you see here, these trichomes, <clears throat> trichome heads. And you'll see from A to F, there's a variety of types. Um, we're primarily interested in C through F. Um, and quick note, um, you notice that the color changes in the trichome as well. It's gonna be important to remember later on in the presentation. Some more pictures of trichomes <clears throat> in relation to the size of the flower. And this slide here is illustrating the development of trichomes. And there is some debate. It's uh, about to be agreed upon, probably, it seems, um, across science as far as the sessile trichomes containing cannabinoids and the cannabis stalked trichome. <clears throat> the uh, sessile trichomes are currently viewed by Samuels, um, cited at the bottom there, as being a early developmental stage of trichome development. And you'll see the ratio of monoterpenes to sesquiterpenes changes throughout that um, development cycle. Illustration of some of the molecules of interest here. These are considered the primary cannabinoids, although the um, cannabivirin and <clears throat> such would be considered auxiliary by some. 
primarily products um, of interest right now are formulating with CBD and CBN, CBG. Um, the cannabivirins are actually a little harder to come by in concentration. They're rarely over a few percent in the raw flour. Another illustration of the complexity that um, can occur in this mixture <clears throat> and during formulation and processing. Um, this image here shows how we start with CBGA and we can, the plant through synthase will create the CBDA type, CBC types. This illustration also shows that photochemical reactions can create the CBNDA type, CBEA type, as well as the CBLA type. I have also noticed these particular cannabinoids coming up in edible products when tested for these specific compounds. These in particular CBLA um, are only um, screened by some labs. It's not a common uh, cannabinoid to screen for current, but um, it just shows how, you know, these molecules are pretty delicate and our processes, if we're not taking care of you know, acids present or pH in general and <clears throat> heat and exposure time to heat, as well as the photo um, chemical effects on the mixture, more complexity develops. And <clears throat> surprisingly, cannabinoids have been the primary component that characterization efforts have focused on since the early 1900s. And in recent years, many, quote, new cannabinoids and their degradation products have been characterized and elucidated. It seems that at least once a quarter, there is a new paper that is um, published uh, showing some new cannabinoid. Um, and all of these have been le much less than 1% weight per weight in the biomass or the extract for that matter. <clears throat> and some recent examples are ester derivatives and carbon chain length or variations on the carbon chain length. Um, recent published paper, they got some uh, wide uh, recognition in the pop science um, realm is the THCP. It apparently has a, um, a great affinity for the receptor and is very potent, but it is, um, it's not being isolated and sold on the market as of yet. Terpenes and terpenoids. You know, the can cannabis plant is really a nature's best perfumer. There is a range of odors um, that the plant produces. Um, and early studies into terpenes were the result of DEA uh, forensic efforts to identify the country of origin for seized biomass and hashish. <clears throat> Dr. Ethan Russo's work on the entourage effect of how terpenes and cannabinoids interact synergetically um, to create effects that are much different than one would expect from using the pure cannabinoid. Um, this effect is still the subject of quite a lot of debate um, as it's relatively hard to, to prove out. Um, but the vast majority of people using cannabis, especially today, recognize that, you know, there is a synergy that occurs um, depending on the different terpenes present. And so far, there's been no unique to cannabis odorants characterized. Um, maybe they will be characterized, or if there, we find out that there's no unique odorants to cannabis, um, it is a complex mixture of terpenes, terpenoids, and beyond terpene, terpenoids, isoprene derivatives um, that could be contributing to these, to the distinctive cannabis odor. Justin Fischtig has done a great amount of work on chemotyping um, different cannabis 
um, varieties, so to say. And <clears throat> these are what he has um, came up with in his paper from, I believe it's 2017. And even still today, we are finding new terpenes that Justin was not finding in new varietals. Because the breeding efforts in cannabis are very widespread and have been going on for quite some time. Um, that's, in fact, how we got these high resin producing uh, CBD dominant varietals. Um, and you'll notice here that there's some alcohol substituted terpenoids, many of which have not been characterized to a great degree. You know, beta caryophyllene, myrcene, limonene, those are all easy to analyze, easy to get standards for, and they're present in quite a large amount um, in the raw flour as well as the extract. And your extraction method is also going to dictate um, how much of these different compounds are preserved. The crude extract. Crude oil, cannabis extract, is a dilating fluid. It is sheer thickening and is composed of generally 60 to 75% cannabinoid acids, one of which THCA or CBDA will be dominant. In the case of you know, these high resin hemp cultivars, CBDA is going to be dominant. Monoterpenes in crude oil can range from three to 7%, maybe even higher too on some cultivars we are seeing these days. And about the same for sesquiterpenes. Um, these are generalized numbers here because there is a lot of variability um, in biomass. And we have beta carophyllene, humulene, balancing, and triterpenes, as well as flavonoids, both of which have not been focused on very much. They are not um, isolated as pure ingredients at this current time. And fats and waxes, um, as well as the gums, phospholipids, carbohydrates, lignans, and chlorophyll. We notice with ethanol extract, we get more carbohydrates and chlorophyll. And uh, that can cause processing issues as they are phalanx um, in processing, post-processing the crude oil into other ingredients. And I, I wanna take this time to say a thank you to the AOCS um, members and organization for the efforts that have been put into refining and <clears throat> yeah, refining crude oils from vegetable oils and beyond this, uh, many of these techniques have been applied successfully to post-processing the crude extract. And um, the AOCS website and resources that are provided free of charge have been very, very valuable to the industry as a whole. Um, one in education on ways to approach different purification steps as well as um, troubleshooting those steps as well and looking forward into new methods to the industry that can be applied, some of which may be old methods as far as um, vegetable oil refining goes. Decarboxylation. You know, decarboxylation is an important step if the end ingredient is going to be distill if it requires distillation like CBD for instance in order to distill CBD we have to have a decarb extract um, it essentially won't go into the vapor phase and causes issues that we'll, we will elaborate later on in the presentation <clears throat> but you see here um, how the carboxylic acid is lost it is a time temperature relationship um, currently most people depending on THC or T, uh, CBD, will decarb at temperatures between 130 and 160 degrees Celsius for 45 to an hour and a half, um, as far as time goes. And decarboxylation is a straightforward reaction. It's easy to do, but it can create a lot more complexity in the mixture. If oxygen is present, um, if, you know, residual acids are present. Um, as mentioned earlier, these molecules are pretty, 
pretty delicate, especially when they are um, inside a complex mixture that many of the components are not characterized or controlled. Here is an example <clears throat> showing how the relative loss of the cannabinoid to decarboxylation. In a perfect world, we would just be losing the carboxylic acid group. Molecules like THC are a lot more rigid. Um, they tend to decarb a lot more straightforwardly than less rigid molecules like CBDA and CBGA. And this also gives a reference to the relative loss in total molar concentration compared to extracts and the pure compound in regards to CBDA. And you'll notice there is quite a difference. And what is created during this <clears throat> has not been fully characterized. We do know that some isomerizations do occur to some of these other cannabinoids that have been least listed previously in other slides. More efforts need to be done in that regard. The industry is in need of comprehensive analytical character characterization of the constituents of hemp extracts manufacturing, utilizing different methodologies. <clears throat> there is no comprehensive characterization data available today. Although recent years, we are seeing more efforts going into this um, type of research. Those efforts need to be replicated and they need to be replicated on a wide variety of biomass and extract types because there is a great difference between a crude oil made from ethanol versus made from a hydrocarbon. And this calls for much needed collaboration between academic and private research institutions. All right, I think we'll stop here and uh, see if there's any questions. Uh, Rob, have you seen any questions come in? We do encourage everyone to please use the Q&A module on Zoom to uh, uh, post any questions you might have or uh, rather or comment in whatever platform you're viewing this video on with your questions and that will be relayed to us by the AOCS team. So uh, we, we welcome any and all uh, questions and answers and there will be a general question and answer section at the end of the presentation as well. And we have one question, uh, just if you could confirm that the ABC did ban CBD beer. Uh, and just to be clear, we're talking beer, meaning something that has alcohol in it, as opposed to just CBD in, in a non-alcoholic beer. Yes, so I believe that this is being handled at this point, uh, primarily on a state by state basis. Um, I am not clear on whether an official federal rule has been brought in. However, in the state of Oregon, as well as I believe in uh, California and Washington, uh, I'm not certain about Colorado, but the, uh, the state specific alcohol regulators have banned the introduction of cannabinoids as an ingredient into alcohol uh, bearing um, beverages, which are sold through the alcohol distributors uh, in those states. Um, there were some CBD inclusive or hemp extract, uh, cannabinoid rich hemp extract inclusive uh, beers and liquors that were brought to market. Um, and then subsequently they were taken off the market uh, by the regulators. So uh, I believe it is state by state basis right now, um, but the trend is, is towards disallowing that. Uh, and that may just be pending uh, further research on the safety of the combination of alcohol with uh, the cannabinoids, as there have been some early indications of potential um, liver toxicity uh, from alcohol and cannabinoids in combination, although that's a very early uh, small sample size uh, studies that are making those implications. So there's follow-up research uh, that needs to be done, and there are some efforts uh, ongoing to uh, help to try and push those research effort, efforts forward. And I have another one for you, Emmett. Uh, for the 2% gum and phospholipid fraction, do you really see phospholipids? You know, um, I'll take this one. Um, 
these have not been characterized. Um, we do know that enzymatic degumming and degumming techniques have been successfully applied to post-processing of cannabis oils. And just remember, those numbers are estimates. We, and there is a wide ver variability in the composition in extracts because in some situations, there is a visible amount of at least polar compounds that come out during a degumming process, but they have not been characterized. But like I said, we do see some success using um, enzymatic degumming techniques. Um, and yeah. That's All right, we have another one. Is there really no data in Europe regarding the hemp components? There, oh, I'll take that one. There is data. Um, data is coming out, um, different institutions, but it needs to be replicated across a wide variety of biomass types, feedstock preparation types, as well as extraction solvents. Also, it's, it's key to um, mention that there are relatively good characterizations of the uh, potential bioactive compounds. So there have been bioassays done um, by the research institutions in Europe, in Israel, and the United States. That's how we know that there are 145 plus uh, terpenes found in the can cannabis plant, more than 100 cannabinoids uh, found in the cannabis plant. These, these are through some relatively rigorous characterization efforts. Uh, however, those are from labs that are focused on the, the pharmacological and pharmaceutical aspect of the plant. So they have largely ignored the, uh, the lipids, gums, uh, the, and other uh, compounds, which are not really as strong of a candidate for potential bioactive applications. Um, so the extracts themselves and the differentiation between different uh, processing methodologies and their resulting impact on compounds found in those intermediate uh, refinement stages, that, that sort of characterization work has not really been done. Although there are a few studies that are starting to apply some ASTM distillation methods uh, to find, to characterize uh, distillation fractions and other things of that nature. Um, but, you know, application of nuclear magnetic resonance to try and characterize some of these unknown constituents, that's, uh, that type of research has really been um, underemphasized in the industry up to this point. Question on decarboxylation. Uh, what difference does it make if it's decarboxylated before or after extraction? Uh, John, you, you're yep, I'm muted. Yeah. For many uh, using supercritical CO2, uh, they will decarboxylate prior. Um, you could see a difference in the side products and matrix effects um, compared to decarbing in a extract versus the flower. Uh, also, you may see differences in terms of your yield, uh, depending on the polarity of the solvent that you're using uh, before and after. Uh, decarboxylation. That this could be relatively minor effects, but as we get into more far-reaching realms of, of candidate solvents uh, for specific specialty uh, extraction processes, that could have an effect because the uh, obviously you're removing that carboxyl group, you're you're changing the, changing the polarity of the compound. Um, but one major effect that we do see is that in, in decarboxylating in the flower. Uh, you are going to thermally degrade some of the compounds in the flower. Uh, and so that can have, you can see increase in color of the, of the resulting oil from things like ethanol extraction. You see typically a darker extract um, and you may see some uh, things like polymerization of some of the lipids. But again, these effects are largely uh, qualitatively qualified and observed rather than being uh, detailed quantified in uh, analytical results. Question on terpenes. Can terpenoids be st steam stripped from the biomass ahead of extraction? Mm -hmm. this, this is the way many oleo resins are right. prepared, but mm -hmm. the listener is concerned about damaging non-volatile compounds. 
Yes, yes. I'm glad someone asked the question. And I am going to cover this a little bit more in depth later in the presentation. Steam distillation and hydro distillation are applied, um, especially in the hemp space, because there's a lot of biomass and the terpenes are valuable. When you go to extract that material that has been steam distilled, that extract does come out quite a bit different, um, particularly in color. Um, and from our experiments seem to have a lower viscosity too, um, for some reason. Uh, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say on it now. Stay tuned later in the presentation where I will elaborate. But it is applied, steam distillation is applied. All right, well, maybe we can uh, go a little bit down uh, the road here with the process landscape and the opportunity space and we can come back for questions later on in the presentation. Uh, thank you all for engaging and please keep the questions coming in and, and we will be keeping a uh, running list of those questions to be answered later on. So the existing process landscape uh, is, is quite broad. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation going on, but we do see some uh, processes being selected uh, quite a bit uh, more commonly than others. In particular, uh, you see um, the ethanol extraction being the most commonly uh, selected technology and technique that makes up over 50% of the total uh, extraction capacity in the United States, according to Hemp Benchmarks, who did a recent survey. Uh, it is selected largely because it's viewed as being easy to get approved on a regulatory basis. Uh, it's viewed as being more safe, both from a worker safety standpoint and a consumer safety standpoint, because of the, you know, any trace residual going into products is, uh, you know, ethanol is considered to be uh, safe in a trace uh, amounts. However, uh, that comes at the cost of higher pickup of, um, of some of these carbohydrates. Uh, it is uh, also, if you're trying to exclude waxes from your process, uh, oftentimes they're using uh, very low temperature uh, extractions to try and improve quality of extract uh, that comes at an energy cost. And the solvent itself is both expensive uh, due to the proof tax. Uh, if you're buying and using pure 190 proof or 200 proof ethanol, um, uh, that can be uh, addressed by getting a tax credit for industrial use if you can have good uh, traceability standards. However, there have been difficulties in the hemp industry getting reliable refunds uh, from the proof tax and the upfront cost does stay high. Um, the other major problem is that it, it picks up water uh, in the process and as well as other near boilers like terpenes. And it's relatively difficult to uh, reproof and repurify ethanol. Um, it, is, uh, it is done, especially at the larger scale, uh, however, the energy intensity and, uh, and the cost uh, versus unit capacity breakdown of the existing applied technologies for reproofing and repurifying ethanol uh, really make it only viable at the, at the very large scale. And uh, when you compare it to the repurification of other solvents, it is still more costly uh, for the most part. Now, that said, we uh, at Sci-Fi Systems have uh, really worked at refining this process, and uh, we sell this equipment uh, foremost among all the equipment that we sell uh, is ethanol processing equipment, uh, and it can be run at a relatively good efficiency. Automation uh, is, of course, key to getting good cost efficiency. Uh, second most common and most popular extraction solvent is supercritical CO2. Uh, now, it's also uh, viewed as being quite safe uh, from a consumer standpoint, uh, as well as um, to, from a workplace safety standpoint, you don't have to have a controlled area uh, for flammables uh, to use a CO2 extractor. That said, of course, it is a very high pressure system up in, you know, in the thousands of PSI under operation. So there are pressure safety concerns uh, and as a result, the cost per unit capacity on this extraction is typically relatively high as compared to the other methodologies. Um, and uh, the selectivity of CO2 is viewed uh, by our company and by many in the industry as being suboptimal. Um, it does tend to pick up a relatively high uh, lipid 
uh, yield uh, in addition to the cannabinoids yielding a relatively low concentration extract. There are ways to address that using multi-stage extraction uh, or fractional uh, separations in the solvent. However, that typically results in a reduced total capacity uh, per unit volume of the extractor uh, vessels themselves. And as a result, your cost per unit capacity goes up when you're using those more advanced methods. Now, in order to address some of these uh, problems uh, or challenges, I should say, um, there is the use of co-solvents like ethanol, propane, and some other co-solvents that, that improve the uh, selectivity uh, and improve the yield from uh, supercritical CO2 extraction. Also, subcritical uh, CO2 extraction has been gaining in popularity because it has some relatively better uh, selectivity properties. Um, it is quite popular. More than 20% of the total uh, installed capacity, it is estimated, uh, is uh, CO2 extraction at this point. Um, uh, then we see the, the heavy hydrocarbons, especially hexane, although also notable are pentane and heptane. Uh, those are rapidly gaining in market share, largely because they are well understood by general industry. Um, the supply chain is very established. There's a lot of established technology uh, in uh, hexane extraction. That said, um, the baseline level uh, hemp hectane extraction yields relatively low concentration crude extracts with relatively high pickup of colorants, uh, as well as lipids and other uh, non-desirable compounds. Um, temperature swing can be used to improve that, as with uh, most of the other solvents on this list. Um, and it is gaining popularity uh, partially because there are large soy and uh, wheat germ plants that are being converted over into uh, hemp extraction plants. Now that takes quite a bit of retrofit uh, in order to handle the sticky uh, flake consistency of hemp. That said, this uh, relative to ethanol uh, and to some extent CO2 has the benefit of not having a, a relatively high water pickup. So the hydrocarbons in general uh, are better suited for extracting wet biomass. Wet biomass is a very uh, popular uh, way to harvest uh, with wet bale uh, on the farmer's side. And it's very difficult to process that material uh, using ethanol in particular. Uh, so uh, viewed as relatively low cost per unit capacity, uh, but it requires quite a bit of retrofit. We have uh, worked with uh, some providers to specify equipment uh, for those retrofits. So that is something Sci-Fi Systems and Artisan Industries are interested in engaging, uh, both on research side as well as application side. Uh, light hydrocarbons, uh, Sci-Fi Systems has put a lot of emphasis in 2020 on light hydrocarbon extraction, especially propane extraction. We have been working with Artisan Industries as well as other uh, other engineering partners on this project. Um, we view this as having some really strong advantages of selectivity that have been validated. Uh, light hydrocarbons are the most common uh, extraction uh, solvent used in the medical and adult use cannabis industries because you could produce high concentration extracts that have a high terpene content uh, and at a very low temperature exposure because the Solvent recovery systems uh, can uh, utilize low temperatures and relatively moderate vacuum while still achieving efficient solvent recovery. That makes them also relatively energy efficient uh, processes. Uh, hexane and light hydrocarbons, all the hydrocarbons have relatively good compatibility with various adsorbent media as well, uh, where ethanol in particular and CO2 to some extent sometimes have problems with dissolving certain functionalized uh, filtration media. So that is another advantage that we'll dive into a little bit later. Um, I should note there are a few other solvents uh, that are used, although much less commonly. Uh, that would be things like pH adjusted water. Um, uh, typically that uh, is a relatively moderate swing in acidity or uh, base alkaline uh, solution as the cannabinoids as well as the terpenes uh, do have um, the potential to isomerize uh, in the presence of uh, strong pH swings. So typically this is combined with a strong mechanical uh, extraction method, things like 
uh, spinning disk reactors. Um, and you, we have seen some pickup of that technology, especially in Canada, uh, where the hydrocarbon extraction has uh, not been allowed for the extraction of hemp. Um, and then finally of note, and the, John will go into this more later, but there are purely mechanical separation potentials, both uh, water uh, sifting of the, the trichomes away from the biomass material, and then uh, air classification or other types of dry mechanical processes uh, used to separate the trichomes away from the biomass. Of course, you're never going to produce a very, very high uh, co concentration extract using these mechanical methodologies, but for some ingredients um, that it, it could be sufficient uh, for the purposes of a, uh, an ingredient for some products. So moving right along to insolvent purification, de-waxing and decoming. This is the uh, most uh, commonly emphasized uh, process in solvent. Uh, it is used to remove your uh, heavy um, waxes. The most traditional method is a winterization technique of dropping the solvent and solution temperature down uh, quite low and holding it for a period of time, allowing for cold precipitation of the waxes and then uh, filtration of that precipitate out from the liquid. Um, that is an energy intensive process, also relatively time intensive. Um, so new approaches, especially using membranes have been uh, applied and are showing great promise. Um, it also is uh, of note that the degumming process that we mentioned earlier is uh, commonly being done uh, with granulate absor adsorbents and some other uh, catalytic uh, type of processes. Uh, there's also decoloring that is done, removal of things like chlorophyll and some of the other colorant agents such as carotenoids uh, using adsorbents. Generally speaking, very uh, excited uh, about membrane technology uh, for those applications as well. Uh, also, the, finally, the insolvent separation of cannabinoids, as I mentioned, removal of THC, particularly from extract, there is a, a high, high demand for that. Uh, and uh, we believe that that's gonna see a lot of technological development uh, shortly. I apologize for the truck noise in the background. Um, uh, the solvent recovery uh, is the uh, relatively simple stage in, in ethanol uh, and hexane, as well as to a lesser extent, the light hydrocarbons, the falling film evaporator is the uh, most commonly uh, applied uh, technology for this um, bulk solvent recovery. Um, and that's a very tried and true technology from other industry. Uh, however, we're seeing a shift again towards the potential of using membranes for this. Uh, also the potential uh, applications of flash distillation for uh, bulk solvent recovery is being explored uh, by us and uh, artisan industries along with other partners. And uh, in uh, it's worth noting that any bulk solvent recovery uh, system, su uh, such as this one that we installed, uh, it does need a secondary stage for polishing, uh, a batch polishing stage using a, uh, a, pot, a pot still type. A traditional distillation is a common application for that. However, application of wipe film evaporators, such as the horizontal wipe film evaporators that artisan in industry provides in the rototherm line um, could make this a continuous process and match that to the continuous nature of the rest of the processes. So we view that as being highly advisable and uh, we're excited to have some announcements upcoming in the year about the cost efficiencies of that type of application. Um, moving right along to distillation. Uh, now we're typically talking about wiped film evaporation uh, when we're talking about distillation. Uh, the stripping of light uh, compounds such as uh, terpenes, monoterpenes, diterpenes, uh, as well as uh, free fatty acids, sesquiterpenes, triterpenes, anything that has a lighter boiling point than the cannabinoids is typically stripped off first, followed by uh, the uh, evaporation or distillation of the cannabinoids away from the heavier uh, fractions. And um, it is... Uh, 
I'm sorry, I seem to have, there we go. Um, and uh, we typically use two stages presently. The common industry standard is the use of uh, uh, short path configuration wipe film evaporators with internal uh, types of condensers uh, for especially the final stage of distillation. Now in partnership with Artisan Industries, we are seeing some very exciting results using horizontal typed wipe film evaporators for this process. Again, track with us. We think there is uh, some major efficiency gains to be had there and that we're gonna see some, some big impacts on the cost efficiency, both of operation and CapEx uh, in this particular process shortly. After distillation, uh, if uh, isolate uh, CBD is desired, then we go to a crystallization process. Most commonly, this is done in a batch reaction, uh, uh, not reaction, but a batch reactor at this point, typically a Nooch uh, filter or a filter reactor is used for this process. Uh, there's two methodologies. There's either cold precipitation or a melt crystallization. Uh, both have been validated. Typically, they're both using a uh, heavy uh, uh, hydrocarbon solvent, such as most commonly uh, pentane for this type of crystallization. Heptane has been used, hexane has been used, uh, isopropyl alcohol to some extent, as well as ethyl acetate. These have all been validated in crystallization. Uh, the goal here is typically uh, a 99.5 or above purity of the uh, crystalline isolate with of course 99.9 and beyond necessary for pharmaceutical applications. Um, finally, uh, there is a big demand out there for remediation of THC from uh, the oils, either crude oil or distillate. And uh, that's because uh, in order to ship the ingredient for, uh, between uh, states at this point, the ingredient itself must be below 0.3% THC. The oil itself is considered hemp. Hemp legally must be below 0.3% THC, a Delta 9 THC for uh, interstate commerce. Also internationally, uh, that uh, in Europe and in Asia, uh, markets like Korea and Japan, um, there's either a 0.2% uh, Delta 9 THC requirement and sometimes a non-detect requirement for importing uh, CBD into or CBD containing oil into those markets. Uh, so commonly chromatography such as uh, flash chromatography or HPLC, uh, preparatory HPLC is being used for this. Also, there was a big uptick in interest in centrifugal partition chromatography in this space. Uh, however, there's been reliability issues with some of those systems as they've been scaled up to preparatory scale really if not for the first time, then for the first time at this uh, common a proliferation across an industry. Um, so it, it does have popularity because of the low cost of the liquid stationary phase, uh, but the uptime has been an issue for operators. Um, uh, so again, chromatography is the typical go-to here. John will talk a little bit about potential for other methodologies. Um, as you can see, these cannabinoid, uh, you know, cannabinoid, uh, targets are relatively close uh, in terms of molecular weight and in terms of affinities. Uh, chromatographic separations, uh, very clean uh, chromatographic separations are uh, you know, fairly difficult, although they have been re re readily standardized and implemented by many operators. Um, and that I think uh, is it for the processes themselves. Um, I, I will say that as far as value added ingredients, uh, there are commonly uh, some value added processes like liposomal encapsulation, spray dried water soluble powders, the inclusion of transdermal agents and salting these cannabinoid acids with other compounds to form cannabinoid salts, as well as the isomerization of cannabinoids. And I know that John will touch on some of those in the next section. Um, so that's a view of the landscape. Um, I think we should just go ahead and head on into your section, John, uh, before taking questions. Okay, opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities that exist um, across the board for um, cannabis hemp processing, um, different co-products. And I'm gonna cover that here in this section. 
Um, my goal here is to inspire. Um, we, as an industry, need the um, participation of academic and private institutions um, with experience from processing other oils, as well as implementing the biorefinery concept. Once again, here, where um, the current opportunity that has been taken by the reins by many in, in the past year, year and a half, um, is conversion of cannabinoids from the mother liquor from the CBD isolation process. Um, there was a period about two years ago where people were giving away this mother liquor. It was considered waste. It was filled with many auxiliary cannabinoids. Um, they are hard to separate chromatographically. It may not be economically viable to do so, um, but many of them can be um, interconverted to these different cannabinoid types, um, Delta-8 THC, Delta-9 THC. And <clears throat> this method here shown is, uh, I believe came out of some of Meshalom's work. Um, as you know, he is the father of cannabinoids, so to say. Um, yeah, we can, you can't, well, we'll stay here for a second. You can look at these uh, <laughs> different uh, reagents and catalysts used here, and it's uh, probably not going to be grass certified um, unless quite a bit goes into it. Um, there are other um, methodologies, but this is the most common in the published literature. Um, next slide. Bioactive ingredients. Currently, when we're extracting cannabis for crude oil for CBD manufacture, we're leaving behind a lot of compounds. Um, it is the goal of a, a good extraction that is meaning will require less post-processing in order to achieve the desired end product to have a very selective and gentle extraction since our molecules are located on the surface of the leaf. We are not performing a leaching operation, or at least we try not to leach. Um, so that leaves thousands of pounds of biomass with a diversity, a whole other dimension of complexity inside the leaf, um, especially you know some of these more polar compounds that have seen some research um, into their pharmacology and <clears throat> they have potential to be used as bioactive ingredients either for biomedical research, drug development, and maybe even ingredients in functional foods. Um, there are some unique components to cannabis that have been found in this regard, and that's the cannabispirols and the canaflavins, A, B, and C. Um, these are currently not sold, isolated and sold as a um, consumer product yet. They are in relatively low concentration, um, but there is opportunity there. Um, not unique to cannabis, but have market value is the fatty acids. Seed oil, you know, that's a whole, whole world in and of itself is hemp seed oil processing and the variety of industrial and consumer goods that could come out of that as well. And depending on how the feedstock is prepped, you may actually have a appreciable amount of seed oil in your hemp crude extract um, that will need to be separated during the post-processing as it will interfere with um, downstream processes and their efficiency. Many um, flavonoids have been identified in cannabis, relatively low concentrations, um, but they are there and they have been studied, many of them, you know, outside of the cannabis context and they're seen as antioxidants and anti-inflammatories and many of them are very, very common um, out there in other plants. And it should be noted that the concentrations of various well, both phytocannabinoids and flavonoids largely depend on factors such as the hemp genotype, vegetation period, what part of the plant was used, and <clears throat> cultivation, harvesting, and storage techniques. And uh, you see there the triterpenes. Um, we have not 
really found anything too unique uh, in there, but they are present. There are also sterols, but nothing unique to cannabis in that regard has been discovered um, as far as I can tell from my research. A lot of the fats and waxes from crude post-processing are thrown away. They are seen as a waste product. The pictured here are some somewhat purified um, fractions of those. And, you know, more characterization efforts are needed. Um, and some of these are already being used in product formulations like skincare products or reformulation into oral products. There is, there is a lot of opportunity in this space for using compounds contained in the plant as ingredients for formula, formulation and for end products. So that is, that is a whole universe of opportunity. Industrial commercial uses, um, the heavy resins from cannabinoid distillation. Um, these are the compounds that remain on the evaporator wall during short path distillation at high vacuum. And <clears throat> this waste fraction, when void of cannabinoids, is rock hard and brittle at room temperature. And interestingly, it is no longer, it does no longer have that tacky, sticky nature um, that the starting feedstock crude had when the cannabinoids are totally removed. We feel there's a lot of opportunity to use this material maybe in polymer composite production. Um, and then we have the obvious cellulose, right? You, we've got a, tons of biomass we're extracting just from the surface. There is lots of opportunities to use that extracted biomass for the wide variety of industrial products or commercial products, um, such as paper, fuels, adsorbents, bioplastics and biocomposites should be noted you know there's a lot of promise out there about the you know hemp plastics and hemp this thousands of uses for hemp well you know, i don't know if we'll see a hundred percent hemp based um plastics but the composites are already being um manufactured and there is opportunity in that space It's been said multiple times and it's the theme of our presentation, characterization of waste products. Back to the biorefinery concept. This stuff is being thrown in the trash currently. Um, <clears throat> and here pictured are some quick examples I had ready um, of extracted biomass. You see on the right, it's just thrown out into a field. Um, that's opportunity. Um, that could be extracted with a polar solvent and you could obtain a, you know, a whole polar fraction Enzym enzymes, you know, the list goes on. And I'm sure a lot of you out there have ideas running in your head right now. Um, cause hopefully I've illustrated that a large amount of the potential is being thrown away as waste. Processing tech to increase the ability to valorize these waste streams. As I mentioned earlier, specific primary extraction that maintains the chemical and structural integrity of the waste stream so that you can re-extract it with polar solvents for the goods mentioned previously. And this specific primary extraction type that I'm hinting at is sci-fi's favorite using light hydrocarbons with, and I will explain later in the presentation in detail, but with light hydrocarbons, we're able to get a very selective extraction with almost zero leaching during that extraction. And we're also able to do it below zero C. So you can imagine how the you know complexity can be conserved in that biomass. Um, and enzymes, as I mentioned earlier as well, lots of opportunity there too on the post-extracted biomass. I will note they have been applied um, in some research papers to pre-extraction. 
um, to pre-treat the biomass, but it's, you know, our, our product is on the surface currently, the cannabinoids and enzymes may have more use in the post extraction side of things. Lots of processing improvements are being made, especially in the past year and a half. We've noticed the price of CBD has went from, you know, well over $2,000 a kilogram to 500 or less dollars a kilogram. Um, so, you know, focus on OPEX efficiency is huge. And pictured here on the top right is a um, continuous flow crystallizer. Um, from Neetech, which we also provide as, <clears throat> and is a good example of process intensification. Um, you know, PI has been a theme in other industries, but it's only now coming into play into the cannabis and hemp processing industry. And it's very important, not only from a environmental and economic benefit, but <clears throat> also, you know, carefully designed systems with this principle in mind can be a lot more compact, can be a lot safer in some cases to operate. So PI is very important to us here at Sci-Fi and we are seeing it implemented across the industry. Looking towards the future, my favorite section. This is what I spend a good bit of my time um, tracking and researching and testing to see the application and benefits of applying such to the industry. Um, one, we'll start with material prep, you know, cryo milling. Um, trichomes are very delicate, they're very sticky. They will break off of the material if, they will break off of the material rather easily and that's a yield loss. You know, that is currently, that's where the product is located. Um, and cryo milling mitigates loss of product to grinding due to the sticky nature, but also due to the heat um, that can occur in hammer milling operations. Um, I know the traditional um, rule of thumb is smaller particle size, the better. Well, if we're breaking this stuff down to such a small particle size that we're crushing these oily resinous trichomes onto the mill and um, equipment, before it even makes it to extraction, we're losing yield. And cryo milling can mitigate this as well as give you a little bit better extraction. You're, you know, it will help you minimize the extraction of cell internals on milled biomass. Cryo sifting also can be used to <clears throat> separate these trichomes from the bulk biomass prior to extraction. It also can minimize the amount of storage um, of the feedstock per finished kilogram of crude. And then we have membranes here pictured below. Um, membranes have been seeing application in the industry over about the past year and a half. Um, and there's still a lot of work to be done in that regard. Um, bulk solvent recovery has you know, seen the most activity so far and then winterization. But as many of you know, the world of membranes is a deep universe and there is a lot of potential there to apply it to this industry in the spirit of process intensification. And I put molecularly imprinted membranes here because it's one of the wildest um, applications of membranes that I could find. And it's not being applied yet to my knowledge in cannabis. I'm sure somebody is working on it. Um, we will see, stay tuned on the membranes. We're gonna see a lot more of that um, particular equipment separation type being applied. As you know, my favorite, Sci-Fi's favorite, light hydrocarbon extraction can take place with N-butane, isobutane, and or propane. Often as a neat, pure solvent or blended solvent. Some operators will prefer to have a little bit of propane with their normal butane for various reasons. We do notice there is a color difference, difference between propane, what propane picks up and butane in terms of color, terpenes, it, it's drastic. And um, these solvents are tunable. However, the tunability has not been mapped um, in the research. 
as far as we know, um, like CO2 has. But uh, this is something that SciFi and our partners have been working on uh, quite a bit for the past year, past few years, actually, but only here in 2020 are we at the point where we're about to see this implemented at a large scale. And it will have significant OPEX savings compared to traditional methods like hexane extraction, um, as well as being able to adapt to changing market demands. Having a lower operating pressure, usually these systems are certified, you know, to 300, 350 PSI, some if they're going to be using propane, especially. Um, that's a cheaper vessel to build. Um, it's, valves are cheaper. The capex is lower compared to supercritical and subcritical fluid extraction techniques. And something you can do with light hydrocarbons that you cannot do with other methods in an efficient manner is extract at lower temperatures. As mentioned earlier, we can extract below the temperature water freezes. We can keep um, <clears throat> a lot of the complexity intact. And there is a lot of research going on in that regard to you know, really define um, the advantages of extracting at a lower temperature. Already, you know, that is an obvious way to tune your solvent, so to say, and you know, have less leaching or pick up less waxes. Um, but there are some other advantages of extracting at lower temperatures in terms of maintaining the integrity of some of these very delicate compounds, um, some of which have not been fully elucidated. Um, also, there are micilla refining opportunities with light hydrocarbons. Um, the you know, small nature of these molecules, increased diffusivity um, is promising. And um, we are working with that. If you look here to the right, this is a crude oil extracted by propane and it has gone through one micilla refining step that sci-fi has developed with our partners. But for the most part, this is a crude oil. It contains over 75% acidic cannabinoids, and it looks like distillate. Notice the cloudiness there. That is CBDA beginning to crystallize. CBDA crystals, until recently, were thought to be pretty difficult to crystallize, and they are coming from other solvents. For some reason, um, probably due to the lower extraction temperatures and you know preservation of some of these delicate molecules, gives us a end product that the CBDA wants to crystallize on its own just in ambient with time. Um, seen here are some hemp seed oil and protein isolate examples extracted with butane. Um, and this was done by a good friend and patent owner in the space, John Henry Davis. Um, that protein isolate has not been post-processed. It does come out that white um, as well as that oil. This is for the most part direct out of the machine. You will not get these kind of results with other solvents without a lot more prose process. Um, gas expanded liquids, I'm real excited about these. There's lots of opportunity <clears throat> playing with GXLs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've got uh, <clears throat> a gas expanded liquid is a mixed solvent composed of a compressible gas such as CO2 or maybe even butane, propane, dissolved in an organic solvent. <clears throat> By varying the CO2 comp the composition in this case, um, a continuum of liquid media ranging from neat organic solvent to subcritical ish CO2 is created, and the properties of which can be adjusted by tuning the operating pressure, much like <clears throat> um, with subcritical and supercritical CO2. This addresses the downsides associated with traditional supercritical fluid extraction. It allows for a dramatic reduction in solvent requirement per kilogram of biomass. And, uh, you know, you could use half to a quarter of the ethanol, for example, in what is called a CXE. Um, <clears throat> and there are tremendous micilla refining opportunities for gas expanded liquids and post-processing. 
this has been applied successfully to both de-waxing and crystallization direct in the process um, using these methodologies. Operating pressures no less than 450 PSIG. You might, there's a lot of different types of GXLs. You may find a GXL that operates at a lower pressure, but primarily focusing on CO2 based here. Um, that does require a higher capex compared to LPG, ethanol, and hexane, but lower opex compared to traditional supercritical fluid extraction, as well as ethanol extraction. And GXLs can also be used in a counter current liquid extraction um, methodology uh, to isolate cannabinoids, post process, you know, micellar refining. And as I hinted at earlier, isolation, crystallization, and particle formation for formulations. Um, if you look at the literature out there, you will see that GXLs are being used quite a bit for obtaining very particular end products that give a finished formulated product a particular characteristic that its value is based upon. Here are some examples of different ways to use GXLs in <clears throat> the preparation of particles, also somewhat crystallization too, in this manner. And um, we have a, uh, A is a particles from gas saturated solution. And B is a gas anti-solvent process. E is the Delios process, <clears throat> and Delios in this case stands for depressurization of an expanded liquid organic solution. And these are the processes primarily that are being applied on the research level to cannabis currently. These other C, F, and D have application as well. We just have not had a chance to explore them ourselves. Synthetic adsorbents, polymeric resins, molecular imprinted polymers, and process catalysts. Some use already, mainly for chromatography. As many of you know, mineral-based adsorbents have lots of application in other oil refining industries. They have found lots of utility in cannabis processing, um, but there is an associated operational expense to using those, and they can be a little bit less specific. Um, molecularly imprinted polymers, for example here, uh, can be tailored to target just the cannabinoids. Um, but the question is with that is how will it scale? And how will it compare to chromatography in terms of OPEX um, because of the solvent recovery requirements? You know, that tends, tends to be forgotten about how much solvent will be required to achieve this particular separation, that solvent will need to be recovered. Process catalysts and reagents, decarboxylation. Some operators are utilizing catalytic decarboxylation processes. Um, and that helps reduce, you know, the, the time or, or the temp uh, associated to achieve that reaction. And it can minimize side product formation. And you know, we could get deep into this topic, uh, and maybe that's part of an eight hour seminar later, um, as well as using process catalysts and reagents for cannabinoid conversions. Um, there is a lot of opportunity in that space, as mentioned earlier, but I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, but some of these methods published are not anything you would want to see in your GMP processing facility. This is a recently published um, paper of a one pot total synthesis of CBN via iodine mediated, mediated deconstructive annulation. And this can create quite a messy product to have to purify to a high degree before it goes into human consumption. Of course, it's easy to do on the bench scale, but on a process scale, I do not see these methods as gaining traction, but they are being used right now by smaller labs um, in the space to convert to CBN 
and some of these operations do not know how to clean up this mixture. Uh, Sulfur-based techniques have been used since the 40s, and those are also being applied out there for CBN production. Due to CBD's lower value now, people are taking CBD isolate and trying to convert it to more valuable cannabinoids. And in doing such, we have to make sure as an industry we are using methodologies that are you know, going to be able to be certified and compliant um, for food and drug use, as well as you know, less harmful to the operators as well. Um, we don't want to see people messing with these type of catalysts. So lots of room for green chemistry to take place. Processing aids, I've hinted at this a little bit earlier as well. Um, Pre-treatment of the biomass, potentially to minimize post-processing um, or increase product yield. You know, we see this with other, um, other in, in un, other industries, but um, as I mentioned, we're not trying to leach in the case of obtaining cannabinoids. Um, but I know that enzymatic um, pretreatments, there is a wide variety out there and still some to be discovered. So not going to throw it out, um, as well as the enzymatic post-extraction treatments towards the biorefinery concept. And <clears throat> in the extract, enzymes are currently applied successfully to degumming. We do not see much degumming occurring at scale, and this could be the result of a couple of reasons. Um, and maybe we will see more of this um, in the future as if we notice how much of a yield loss the gums being present during the distillation process is affecting our efficiency. Um, because this process is, you know, rather OPEX um, intensive and it takes time and um, we will, we'll see how that plays out. It's being more applied in the THC space where they have to have a very pure um, and non-oxidative <laughs> distillate. Um, we notice that the gums are left in, in a high potency distillate, it tends to change color. Um, as mentioned earlier, these need to be characterized too. Um, and distillation and trainers. Uh, for cannabinoid separation. We've seen hints at how this could be applied. We noticed just the difference between beta karyophyllene and beta karyophyllene oxide, the boiling point difference is rather um, large between those two. And that can affect the way that these different compounds distill. Um, lots of work to be done in that regard. Um, and flocculants for de-waxing and potentially even cannabinoid separation. That would be really nice if um, the industry can come up with some, uh, you know, green food safe or very easy to remove um, processing aids just in general. Process mon monitoring analysis and control. Believe it or not, up until about two years ago, automation was not a word used very widely in this industry. Um, <laughs> over the past, you know, Year, year or so, it's become more demanded by our clients that come to us. Um, this has been a piece of sci-fi's, um, you know, core offering since day one. People are now willing to pay for it and see the advantages of having an automated system. Um, something we are looking into currently is the industry 4.0 um, paradigm here, you know, which can offer a whole wide variety variety of remote sensing and control techniques um, as you know which could help a company like sci-fi with troubleshooting equipment or even potentially operating equipment for new operations as they are getting started in process analytical tech is also becoming implemented to some extent um, beyond the research phase um, and this will grant you gains in efficiency, quality control and assurance, and help you stay compliant. You know, as Emmett mentioned earlier, you know, the FDA is not really involved as much as they could be in this industry as they do become more involved, you know, and pr process monitoring and analytical techniques um, to control that process to assure a particular quality or type of end product or 
potentially lack of contaminant or you know to discover a contaminant present um, this is going to see more traction and acceptance in the space as things move forward and regulations become more stringent all right uh thank you john and before we move into uh questions and answers i just wanted to emphasize that uh, you know sci-fi systems our our goal from day one has been to uh, bring in the most uh, contemporary science of phytochemistry to be applied to the industry we rely on uh, partners uh, to to do that with us um, we really are looking to for research institutions or individual uh, engineers to partner with to bring uh, innovative findings from early stage findings into commercialization uh, as well as to transmit useful information from academia or public research uh, to our clients so we really welcome anyone uh, who wants to contact us and uh, potentially uh, partner even if that means just getting your paper more traction or uh, more visibility we'd be glad to do that um, we have started a, uh, a webinar series, so perhaps we could feature you in that webinar series or on our blog. Um, our overarching goal for our clients is to increase process efficiency, improve product quality, and uh, re reduce the operating cost. Um, that's really a baseline essential in this market where it's become very competitive very quickly. Uh, although the growth space is still very strong, the uh, competition in the U.S. and internationally uh, has become uh, quite brisk. Uh, and of course, safety for our consumers and safety for the operators in the plants are of very, very high uh, importance to us. So we want to help our industry partner with research organizations, proving out the safety of new ingredients uh, and of new processes being applied uh, to the production of consumer uh, facing products and ingredients going into those products. So thank you for joining us. If, uh, if you have the opportunity uh, or an interest in uh, partnering with us, find us at sci-fi systems.com. You can contact us through the contact form there, sci-fi systems.com slash contact. And we are partnering uh, with artisan industries on development of a variety of uh, products and projects. Uh, Rob, uh, you can find him at righteous at artisanind.com. Uh, please contact us, and I would be glad to take some questions. Uh, and it looks like there's a pretty good lineup. Okay, so um, just going back up, the one question that I'm going to ask uh, for our viewer, and then I'm going to propose a ballpark answer, and you guys can elaborate on um, the question. Currently, what is the best extraction process? Um, and, and my answer is gonna be, it depends on what you're trying to make. Uh, because as they've been showing you today, there's a wide range of, of desired in products. And uh, we really need to get a feel for what's the market you're going after uh, before we can zoom in on what would be the best process. But if, if uh, John and Emmett wanna elaborate on that, that might be a good, good starting point. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Rob, Rob, I think you hit it on the head. Uh, it really depends on what your goals are. Um, we really like the light hydrocarbons for a lot of uh, applications. It does require uh, operating in a heavy industrial zone and having the appropriate pr uh, approvals for, you know, a pressurized flammable solvent. Um, but that said, uh, we, we really think that that's going to be increasingly used in the future for cannabis and for other industry spaces as well because of the benefits of low temperature exposure and relatively uh, high efficiencies uh, in terms of solvent cost and energy cost. Um, that said, um, if you're trying to go big, fast, and you have relatively uh, tight budget, uh, maybe you should consider going towards uh, hexane or, or ethanol uh, as an option where you can have lower pressure operating systems, um, especially if your goal is to go towards isolate market or distillate uh, market as being your primary offtake, um, those methodologies can be efficient. And along those lines, we have a question, the, these solvents other than uh, CO2 or 
uh, ethanol, would they have a negative perception by consumers? I'll take that. Um, because it's something I didn't really get to touch on real quick. Uh, imagine the person ask, asking the question um, already knows about the negative association with some consumers, which comes from early on in the THC space, about butane being a dirty solvent. It is. Um, it can be a dirty solvent. Um, you have to purify that solvent before you use it. Um, and it's really a consumer education piece. I think if we can appropriately educate the consumer to understand the quality benefits of light hydrocarbon extraction, that negative connotation will go away. And I think it's starting to already. It comes from the early days where people were using canned butane. Um, a lot of people don't even know that light hydrocarbons can be deodorized. Um, so there will be education on that part. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so we are, you know, obviously advocating for the use of instrument grade uh, light hydrocarbons for the extraction solvent that's non odorized, high purity, um, uh, specifically uh, for high purity applications. Um, as far as the consumer education standpoint goes, uh, there, as the uh, adult use in medical cannabis markets have spread state to state, there's been a wave of education about light hydrocarbon extracts that go along with that. So among that specific uh, market, I think there's broader acceptance of the light hydrocarbons. And um, at the same time, um, the, uh, considera the, the marketing tactic from an end user products perspective uh, of specifying what type of extraction methodology was used uh, for the production of the ingredient going into the product. Uh, we're seeing that is still present, but it's less emphasized now than it was a few years ago. Um, now there will more often just be the distinction between an organic process and a, and a conventional process. Um, as we know, your corn oil, your soy oil, your, uh, you know, most of the food oils that go into the consumer food products uh, internationally and domestically are produced using hexane. Um, so the general acceptance of hexane extraction, uh, whether people cognitively uh, understand that or not is almost universal. Um, that said, there's no other than organic certification, there's not really a marketing battle for you know, ethanol per manufactured corn oil, for example. Um, that's just faded to organic, non-organic. As of right now, ethanol and CO2 Potentially, some additional specialty green solvents are the go-to choices for organic uh, certified, USDA organic certified uh, hemp ingredients. And we're going to go back <clears throat> to the subject of terpenes. Uh, the same viewer was asking, uh, in far as the terpenes being steam stripped from the biomass ahead of extraction, um, he's saying that this is the way many oleoresins are prepared, but he's concerned, concerned about damaging the, the volatile compounds. Yes. And then, and then he goes on to say that the terp terpenoids get co-extracted with non-volatiles and can be lost during the desolvitizing crude extract. Yes, that's, that's right. I mean, one key thing here, this is another uh, advantage of light hydrocarbons you see similar advantages for supercritical and subcritical CO2. If you're using a solvent that takes a lower, you know, that has a uh, lower boiling point, well, you have the advantage there of uh, co-distilling less of your co other compounds present in the extract. Uh, similarly, when you're using water to uh, deodorize, um, you are going to bring along some of the potentially valuable compounds uh, out of the extract when you do that. Obviously, you can pull those compounds out of the steam water stream, but many of them are quite thermally liable and some of them are not well characterized uh, and they form complexes. So, John, you have additional? Yeah, I can say from a qualitative standpoint that, you know, steam distilled cannabis oils, you know, containing terp, no, no cannabinoids, just odors um, to broadly classify it smells quite different than when you extract those odorants aromas using temperatures below zero C. 
Um, and we believe that's due to some of the, um, to maintaining some of that complexity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so that's just to reemphasize that the cannabinoids themselves can tolerate the heats uh, that are used for solvent recovery for hexane, uh, ethanol, those other solvents uh, relatively well, uh, at least in moderate uh, uh, periods of time. However, it's the other compounds that are found in the extract mixture. There are many of them that are very thermally uh, liable. And um, so you do see a de you know, degradation of the overall extract quality, the higher temperature you have to use for solvent recovery. And I'll finish with it that some of these it on your end product, depends on your end product. Terpenes and saving terpenes may not be your goal. Um, but as we see more global acceptance um, of, you know, consumable, vaporizable um, cannabis products, these terpenes are going to be, from hemp, are going to be very valuable for formulation into these other cannabinoid um, ingestibles. Um, so. And I, I have a question on the, um, the, uh, the cannabinoid content in a crude oil. He mm -hmm. says it seems very high. And I wondered if you could should, give some relevance yeah. to what should, there's, there's crude, crude oils and there's crude oil. <laughs> right, right. And, and go, you know, this is based off of starting material containing at least about 10% cannabinoids. Um, and I should also clarify that those numbers are based on cannabinoid acid content. So when you decarb those, you're going to lose about, you know, 13% or so weight of cannabinoids. So those numbers could be tempered back a little bit. Um, I don't see crude oils. Uh, the worst crude oil I've seen is around 40. I don't doubt that they get lower than that, but um, you know, that's a 60 to 75 is a decent um, average target window for minimized post-processing as, uh, as well. I, I actually, I do remember that there were some extracts, this was some years ago, but uh, produced using some less pure solvents at uh, higher temperatures that were coming out in the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, also, there was some experiments done in extracting the chaff from seed, uh, you know, from seed, oh yeah, from seed production. And that came out, you know, in, in the relatively low, you know, in the teens and 20s. So it is, you know, we're typically when we say that sort of 60 to 70 percent range, that's using uh, optimized extraction. Typically, that would be ethanol at a maximum of room temperature, but generally below that, uh, a specified, you know, 10 percent or plus starting biomass material. If you use room temperature or, or uh, higher temperature hexane, um, we've heard that that uh, concentration can go down. Supercritical CO2, additionally, uh, sometimes can yield lower concentrations, so 50s and 40s, if you're taking a very broad cut um, of, you know, it is a tunable solvent. You can tune it to maximize for yield, but you're going to, you know, pick up a lot of those waxes and, and oils uh, proportionally. Uh, <clears throat> another question on de why are you de-waxing and crystallizing CBD oil? Why not just leave the, the waxes in there? Well, I mean, some may choose to do that, depending on the end product. Um, the waxes being present do interfere with the efficiency and effectiveness in some cases of these different post-processing methodologies. Um, if going towards an isolate or a distillate end product. Uh, additionally, when you're using them in uh, formulated products, consumer products, uh, there's concern about the standardizability of, uh, of the ingredient. Right now, there's, it's not a commodity where there are grades of, a, of the commodity. You can't just buy a standardized grade of hemp tech extract and expect it to be exactly the same concentration and uh, composition of minor uh, constituents. So uh, a higher potency uh, extract that has less of the other compounds such as fats and waxes is viewed as being more consistent in formulation of end products. Um, also, uh, sometimes these, the oil is being put into 
uh, products that have uh, relatively high water content. In those cases, having higher wax composition can lead to separation. Um, if you're doing some of the specialty valorization of the ingredient, like uh, making water soluble powders, the fats and waxes can disrupt some of those processes. So there's a variety of reasons why you might uh, choose to remove the fats and waxes, but typically it's the first stage of increasing the potency of the, of the oil for either just to use it as a downstream uh, uh, ingredient directly into a product or for further post-processing. Emmett, you might want to add in, um, there's quite a variance in what people define as a full spectrum or a broad spectrum I mean, some people will refer to a, a, a full spectrum product that has no terpenes. So could you kind of clarify what, what industry definitions there are for this? Because you see it on labels all the time. So, yes, unfortunately, the marketers will always um, jump on the bandwagon, right? So uh, the, the sort of true definitions of... Um, Full spectrum would be an extract, which is a simple crude that has not been post-processed in any way. Now, uh, in common parlance, full spectrum is actually used to indicate that it has not been THC remediated and that all of the cannabinoids um, in the original plant are still present. Um, so you could see something what claimed to be a full spectrum distillate. Now, typically distillates have the terpenes removed. Um, they are highly refined, uh, but because they have the full spectrum of cannabinoids, they call it a full spectrum distillate as, comp as compared to what's sometimes referred to as a broad spectrum distillate, uh, which typically refers to a distillate that has had the THC remediated out of the distillate. So um, there are various marketing terms that, are, that make navigating the space fairly challenging. Um, there's also you know, differences in when people say THC free, they may actually just mean that it's below 0.3% THC, while others might mean that it is truly non-detect THC when it is taken to analytical and uh, tested. So it's a very messy space in the marketing side. And so as a result, our internal industry lingo is challenged. Similarly, uh, winterization, for example, is being used as parlance for de-waxing um, they are used relatively interchangeably. Of course, winterization more, um, more specifically generally refers to the cold precipitation of the waxes rather than uh, something like a membrane, but you will see people say it's a winterization membrane. Um, that, of course, doesn't necessarily really make sense in the true sense of the word, but industry parlance shifts rapidly and is relatively diverse. There's not a, a truly standardized lexicon at this point. And we have a, is a double question on the same topic. Um, how much wax is present in crude CBD oil? And when you de-wax, do you think that the good compounds of the CBD will be lost in the solid fraction removed during de-waxing? I'll take that. Um, you know, there's a, a wide range of waxes um, present in cannabis crudes. I mean, that depends largely on both the biomass um, that was extracted. Um, you know, how, how well was that prepped? Is it just flowering tops as well as the extraction method? You know, is it just getting those trichomes or is it getting some of those, epi, um, those leaf surface waxes? Um, so that's why I give a wide range there. And honestly, I've even heard some coming out with even larger amounts than the 10 to 25% that I listed. Um, and that's probably largely due to both the feedstock and the extraction method. And will the good compounds be lost in the solid fraction in a traditional winterization cold precipitation process? That is possible, it's not impossible. And the separation of that solid wax fraction um, depending on the process used can result in cannabinoid losses. If done properly, you can minimize that. I'm sure if you test the waxes directly, you, you may find 
one percent. I know that we've seen up to five percent in an inefficient DWAX winterization process, but they that can be resolved. And one key thing to factor in there is that winterization often takes uh, anywhere from an hour to some people will let a winterization process sit at low temperature for even a full day or more. Um, <clears throat> when you uh, speed that process up, obviously you can shell mm -hmm. that solution down to very low temperatures very quickly. The, the sort of common understanding is that if you go very fast and you cause the, uh, the precipitation of those waxes very quickly, you can include some of the oil. So you can uh, essentially uh, form that wax matrix around droplets of the extract itself. And then you'll of course lose some of the target compound to the wax when you do that. Now, a methodology that might use some sort of process aid to allow for that uh, very quick chilling to effectively separate the waxes like a flocculant or something like that, that could exclude and prevent the inclusion of the, uh, of the target compounds, that could be a useful technique. Um, although what we do see in the uh, early stages of the membrane implementation, uh, which we've done with, our, uh, with a partner vendor, ECOS, um, is that there is a, a certain amount of retention of the target compounds in the wax fraction uh, when you're doing a size exclusion uh, separation and uh, you're relying on diafiltration uh, to you know, push those cannabinoids through the membrane. And so it's really process dependent in the membrane space. Um, so, uh, and obviously the composition of the membrane itself, uh, we're in the very early stages of exploring that functionalization of the membrane could lead to better uh, rejection ratios. Um, so very interested to see that move forward. Another question, are there any methods to isolate CBDA from the crude prior to distillation? Yes, yes, there are. Um, and our favorite method is using a light hydrocarbon. Um, we can essentially end up with a acidic cannabinoid dominant crude. And from that, the CBDA will crystallize on its own over time, or, you know, you can do a crystallization procedure in that hydrocarbon. Um, for some reason, this works very well with butane and propane. Um, so you can do that. You can wash that crude where the CBDA has crystallized um, with a different temperature, you know, pro propane, butane, or another solvent and achieve a high purity CBDA um, isolate. Also worth noting, of course, is that there have been proof of concept with uh, gas expanded liquids, uh, even gas expanded mm -hmm. uh, ethanol uh, using CO2 that has shown the ability to crystallize acid form cannabinoids uh, in, in that uh, solvent as well. So. It is, it is certainly possible to, to do this separation. Uh, I didn't dive much into chromatography. Uh, there has been research into same solvent uh, chromatography from uh, the extract using the same extract solvent and going directly into a chromatography column. Um, there has been rel some early indications of success, but no, no extremely well refined methodologies for that. Um, for whatever reason, the industry at large has not adopted normal, low pressure, large column chromatography as a standard method, typically going to higher pre pressure methodologies. Um, but with some of these, um, you know, specifically formulated resins, uh, it seems it is feasible to do a chromatography process in a solvent like butane, propane, or even potentially in solvents like, uh, like ethanol, um, or hexane. Also, it is worth noting that there are supercritical fluid chromatography methods that are utilized to separate the cannabinoids uh, from each other in that supercritical CO2 solvent. Um, again, relatively high cost per unit capacity, but that's been a validated method for some years now. How stable is the CBD oil? Is there any tendency of oxidation? Yes, there is. And once again, it depends both on the 
you know, the starting material as well as the extraction method and post-processing that has been applied to that crude. Um, one type of, you know, qualitative oxidation that we notice it in some crudes is a, a color change. Um, and that can be, you know, pretty obvious within a relatively short time. The cannabinoids seem to be pretty stable in the crude matrix um, over time uh, at room temperature. But once again, there is lots of room for opportunity here to do, you know, specifically designed stability studies on these different types of crudes and different types of end products. Also uh, worth noting is that especially a big impact on the oil uh, can be, uh, you know, the presence of water. Um, some extracts have a greater potential to hold water than others. Um, hydrocarbon extracts typically have relatively low water inclusion because the, the solvent itself doesn't pick up much water. Uh, ethanol uh, and even to some lesser extent CO2 um, can retain some water. Obviously, if you're using a water-based extraction methodology, getting the water out of the extract is a, is a big concern. Um, also, if for long-term storage, uh, there have been uh, operators out there using nitrogen-charged uh, you know, long-term storage containers in order to um, inert the atmosphere to prevent oxidation. During the distillation of the crude, pull off terpenes, resins, et cetera, what percentage of the CBD is lost? Typically, uh, you know, we will see 5% of the residue fraction containing CBD. Um, it also depends, it seems, on upstream, you know, post-processing prior to distillation that has occurred. You know, potentially maybe some of these waxes or gums or carbohydrates for that matter could be you know, contributing to that. I've seen as much as 25% weight of the residue fraction. And just to note here, um, our standard rule of thumb um, is a 70-30 split in distillation, meaning 30% of, you know, your distillation feed is residue. And of course, this is a spectrum, right? It's, a, it's up to operator, the operator to develop an SOP. You can go low and slow and really optimize for yield at the sacrifice of capacity. Some people go hot and fast, and you can, of course, have a less pure extract and potentially leave more cannabinoids behind if you're going at a lower temperature but at a faster rate. So uh, it's, a, you know, it's a mechanical system operating on a phase change principle. So there's a lot of variables you can push and pull at, but that sort of 5% left in the, in the residue is fairly common. It can be brought down. Um, you can also reprocess your residue. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say on that is there's always loss, of course, to your piping. Um, so if you're using a clean in place solution that allows you to recover the uh, oil that's left adhering to your interconnecting tubing, that will reduce your loss to that, but uh, it is a highly viscous, um, sticky uh, material. And even at a higher temperature where the viscosity is brought down, it will adhere to some extent on uh, standard stainless steel piping. And especially on larger systems, we focused on designing um, for minimal loss to that piping, but it's still inevitable to some degree. And to hone in on that a little bit, the, the question, how much CBD is lost in the wax? And this viewer is seeing 45% of the wax is CBD or acids in the samples that they have analyzed. Yeah, I don't doubt that has occurred um, at all. That would, that would indicate to us that there is something wrong with the process that needs to be improved. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, you know, we would wanna see that number 5% or lower. And one thing that could contribute to that would be how well the um, solution is being homogenized before they initiate the, yes. uh, the temperature decrease. So if you are actually introducing the oil into the solvents explicitly for the purpose of winterization, as is common uh, in combination with supercritical CO2 extractors, 
that's an additional cost with the CO2 system is often you will have an ethanol inclusive step for this dewaxing process. Um, if you do not, do not efficiently homogenize that solution, uh, you're more likely to include more of your, uh, your target compounds when the waxes precipitate. We've seen a, a marked, mark, markedly different uh, results just by choosing to homogenize prior. So here's a marketing question. What is our view of the CBD market trend? Is it hype that will saturate the market in two or three years, or is it a business that will keep growing for the next 10 years? So based on all of the market data trends that, that I've tracked, um, the CBD market globally, uh, worldwide, uh, is far from saturated. Uh, as we said, you know, and I can actually even maybe go back to this graph. Um, I'll, I'll wait to do that. But essentially, uh, we are right now probably uh, over the next five years still going to see a 1.5x growth, uh, or at least, and uh, potentially up to 2.5x growth on total uh, monetary value uh, exchanged in both the consumer market and the ingredient market for CBD. Um, and now that's largely due to global penetration, uh, international markets um, getting more pickup of uh, CBD products. Um, now, right now, the price of uh, CBD in particular and hemp ingredients overall has declined precipitously over the past two years, especially over the past year, we've seen as much as 70% decline. Largely that's due to inefficient operations and operations built on very costly debt. Those operations uh, had very high costs of manufacturing. And as a result, as the pricing declined due to larger uh, capacity operators and more overall processing operators coming online, they were unable to stay afloat at the lower price point. Now that said, we are probably at the bottom of uh, the pricing of crude oil. Um, we'll see if the other value added ingredients um, are at the bottom, uh, but crude oil is, is likely being priced uh, at or below cost right now. Um, there is liquidation happening as there are some very large companies that are going through bankruptcies like Gencana among others. Um, and so those companies have flooded the market with very low cost uh, extract. Um, at the same time, FDA has yet to rule explicitly that interstate commerce can allow for uh, food uh, and nutritional supplements that include CBD. Now, once that happens, we expect large scale manufacturers to get into the space. We're starting to see that already. Um, I believe that um, Ocean Spray has just come out with a beverage inclusive of CBD. So you could see that going into uh, supermarkets across the country, uh, but Coca-Cola, you, you know, Unilever companies, um, these companies have yet to really get into the CBD industry because they're waiting on regulatory clearance from the FDA explicitly for food products. Um, when that happens, there will be a substantial increase in demand and very large lot purchasing. So that will account for uh, a good amount of growth. So we're not saturated on the consumer product side. And as a result, we're not saturated in terms of demand for ingredients. Now, now total capacity of production of ingredients is relatively high and has outstripped short-term demand. But that said, international markets are growing. Uh, the demand in Africa, in Europe, in South America and Asia, um, as well as Oceania are all growing much more rapidly even than domestic demand uh, currently. So the international market uh, is a, a, a valid source of a lot of the growth that's uh, coming down the pipeline, so. So along those lines, uh, Emmett, I just, and it looks like we're coming up on our, on our two hour mark here. Um, the economies of scale, uh, I think is gonna play a, a huge uh, factor in dealing with these existing facilities that are, that are struggling because they're having such uh, high operating costs and low product quality. Um, we've been working artisan and sci-fi on some fairly large scale 
propane systems. You do want to comment a little bit about the about economies of scale and, and what's, what size equipment you, you think is, is going to be meaningful and, and to compensate for this uh, dropping of CBD price? Absolutely. So we saw uh, from the review that uh, a survey that Hemp Benchmarks, uh, which highly recommend that everybody take a look at Hemp Benchmarks from, uh, from New Leaf, um, they are by far the best source of pricing data if you're interested in pricing data. Um, so the survey they did showed that uh, there are it, basically most operators are in between somewhere of the 1,000 to 4,000 pounds of biomass per day of production capacity. Um, now that said, there's a growing uh, segment, especially with these, uh, hep these hexane plants that are converting over that are capable of processing 50,000 or 100,000 pounds of biomass per day. So what is the meaningful entry point? If you're going after uh, isolate products, if you're going after distillate products, these sort of bulk standardized commodities, and you're not trying to address under addressed markets like THC free uh, oil or uh, I, uh, CBD acid uh, or um, you know some of the minor cannabinoids and you have partnerships with farms to do that, or you're going after organic certified high quality extract, then your entry point is probably it's got to be larger than 5,000 pounds a day. You're probably looking at 10,000 pounds a day to 20,000 pounds a day of biomass throughput capacity. Um, if you're going at the specialty ingredients, you could still start a business at 4,000 pounds a day or so and have a viable business, but get your demand locked in first. Know where you're going to sell your ingredient, build that relationship and build your plants to address that demand uh, because the operators that are going out and building uh, these plants with the attitude that, oh, we can just sell it, it's no problem to sell. Right now, it's a very, very competitive market and relationships with uh, buyers is most important. So when we look at butane plants for us, we want to produce, uh, you know, we want to be targeting something like 250 to 500 to 1500 uh, pounds of throughput capacity per hour. Um, and so for that reason, uh, that will give you an economy of scale that really brings your OPEX down, especially when you're applying the, the degree of uh, automation that we are applying to those systems. Um, we have a couple of questions on the CBD emulsions mm -hmm. uh, changing to a pinkish color over time, particularly under sunlight. And they're asking if it's due to oxidation and degradation of the CBD. Yes, uh, likely. Um, you know, taking the other emulsion ingredients out of this equation, CBD and THC, um, for that matter, can oxidize um, some sort of quinone, maybe hydroxyquinone and its dimer. I'm, you know, these have to be hard researched and elucidated, but we're pretty sure that's what it is. Um, and it takes very little of that to change a color of a distillate or a formulation um, pretty drastically, um, and it can be pH related as well. Um, even the pH of your, say your brine scrubs upstream before distillation, um, the final pH can affect the color of the distillate surprisingly. And I have seen purple, I've seen light pink, um, even green, and you know maybe we can get other colors out of that. And it's usually a small amount of that um, oxidized compound that's causing that color. And of course, it, we should say that there are other compounds, you know, the hydroxyquinone, as, as John just mentioned, but there are other compounds, the terpenoids, uh, and some other highly reactive compounds that react to oxygen quite readily that can also contribute uh, to the coloring. So if you're using a crude oil as the basis of your emulsion, there's multiple different sources of color that you could be seeing uh, emerge over time. Uh, typically, if you're going into an emulsion and you're in water, obviously water is contributing oxygen, so it is likely to react over time. Um, stabilizing that is, uh, is, I think, a high demand area of development. There are various uh, process developers that are selling their processes for uh, selling stable, color stable, uh, clear emulsion uh, technology. 
Um, I think there's still demand for that uh, as applied to other cannabinoids, as applied to broader extracts. Um, so definitely an area of interest. A regulatory question. What can be done to push the FDA to approve CBD use in foods? Well, we're in a comment period. Uh, <laughs> so you can go on the FDA website uh, or just search uh, for FDA uh, CBD comment um, or FDA hemp comment. Uh, so please, yes, post specific uh, requests that the FDA regulate uh, CBD as a, an approved dietary ingredient for use in food and uh, nutritional supplement products. The industry overwhelmingly supports this. Um, uh, now the industry is starting to initiate uh, industry-wide or industry association or just multi-party funded safety studies. Um, if you wanna contribute to pushing the FDA forward to approval, they've requested the industry supply validated studies that demonstrate the safety of the ingredients. So you can financially support uh, those or, or just uh, spread awareness that those uh, research studies are ongoing. Um, or if you're a research organization, part of a research organization, uh, part of a, an academic institution, we are badly in need of validating studies demonstrating the safety of the cannabinoid ingredients um, at various levels of ingestion uh, and in combination with various medications, in combination with uh, vary it with alcohol in combination <clears throat> with other common food ingredients. The more basis of research for safety that we have, um, the better it's the easier it's going to be to convince the FDA to move. We should say that on the medical side, uh, where you know cannabinoids have been considered since the 70s uh, for their um, use in pharmaceuticals uh, or in other uh, ingestibles, uh, it has a very good safety profile. So. Typically, the research that does exist, other than uh, a few small uh, sample size studies, shows uh, good safety profiles. Um, so we need, but we need more specific, larger scale studies validating those findings. All right. So that's the end of the questions. Uh, so why don't we, uh, Emmett? Would you like just to do a little conclusion and 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 we'll wrap it up? Sure. Well, I uh, just wanted to thank everyone once again for joining us. Uh, my name is Emmett McGregor from Sci-Fi Systems. Uh, we are primarily focused on deploying uh, at scale automated uh, uh, you know, state of the art equipment into the hemp industry. We partner uh, across the board with uh, equipment providers, with process developers, with research organizations to improve the uh, equipment and the processes we're developing uh, we have a wide range of collaborators and clients interested in engaging with research organizations. Please reach out uh, to us and uh, connect with us. Find our presentation and more information on the AOCS website um, attached to this presentation. Uh, and we really are pushing forward with partnering with Artisan Industries in developing new applications for the rototherm, which we've seen extremely good results with both in solvent recovery and in uh, cannabinoid distillation, as well as broader projects in uh, propane uh, and light hydrocarbon extraction, hexane extraction. We deploy ethanol extraction, distillation, anything across the board. Uh, please reach out to us for any additional questions you might have. Find us at sci-fi-systems.com and artisanindustries, artisanind.com. 